All right. Thank you all for uh, coming here this afternoon. My name is Richard. I work at Pivotal. I'm Asa. I work for Microsoft. Uh, today we are going to talk about serverless event. Yeah, we're going to have some fun, mostly demo. We're going to show you a lot of code that may or may not work, so it's going to be really exciting. And then we are going to show kind of event-driven architecture. We're going to take a look at a lot of different Azure functions, give you a sense of how things work together. And the point of this is also to show you how Java works well on Azure as well as Cloud Foundry, give you a sense how this works. Uh, this is going to be so hot, you're going to need to know the fire exit, apparently, in all of these presentations, so buckle up. So event-driven architecture, I know we talk about this stuff, but we probably see this in a lot of different places. Asar, do you drink coffee? Oh, yeah, yeah, every yeah. day. Nice. Uh, so that's pretty much asynchronous, right? I mean, you don't yeah. stand there and wait for the barista to give you the coffee. Typically, you move away, and then they say your name probably incorrectly, and then they'll hand you the coffee later. So it's kind of event-driven based on them calling your name. Mm -hmm. Processing a loan, you know, I think we own houses in the Seattle area. And Everybody, you yeah. got to go through the loan process, yeah. and that's step by step, right? It's a series of events. It's not one synchronous process through. We see that all the time. Customer complaints, you call up and, and yell at somebody, maybe Microsoft, about a, yeah. a weird support issue. Weird support issue. That's, uh, it triggers something, right? They're not constantly polling their customers, although I think they do, kind of how are things going. It's event-driven. It's based on getting some feedback. And then finally, Hey, all of you, of course not now, because this is an awesome presentation, but you often check email. And that's often event-driven, right? You respond to the event, you do something with it. So we're surrounded by events in an architecture, but building a modern one usually takes a different kind of approach. So we've actually built an architecture for you, and we're going to build this, some of this together. And it kind of uses this fictitious example of a store of coffee variety, as we're both from Seattle that wants to do more event-driven ordering from different branch locations. We're going to be generating load, generating inventory. We're processing that data in the database. I want Oscar to talk about some of the technology here. And then using Pivotal Cloud Foundry in the Boston location, using Azure App Service in additional regions, because we're actually going to, in this session, add Singapore to the mix. And this is real life. We're actually adding this in these real locations, right? Yes. No, nothing up your sleeves. You're wearing short sleeves. So nothing up your sleeves. This will be legit. And we're going to kind of see how you scale an event-driven architecture out in Azure. But did you want to explain some of the key tech in here, like Azure Functions and Cosmos? Sure, yeah. So when we talk about event-driven here, we are talking about serverless. So serverless, a piece of code that's triggered by any events, right? So whether it's a coffee store or a loan processing or customer complaints, there are plenty of events in the world, right? So the serverless, then it turns into event-driven Java. Now imagine, imagine there is a, a real-time inventory hub, right? So serverless and event-driven. Um, in this case, very often the retailers tell us, right? They want to provision a store or provision a region where they have lots and lots of terminals, whether it's a warehouse terminal or a store terminal. They want to provision in less than five minutes or less than 10 minutes, right? How fast that they, they want to expand, right? So what, what you're looking at here is um, like a, a mix of things. So let's take a focus on what's happening in Boston. The same thing is being scaled to London, and today what we'll show you is what's happening in Boston and London, and then we're going to start deploying into Singapore, and you'll see how responsive and how event-driven it is, right? So let's look at the Boston, right? So there are four key things here when you look at this picture. The first one is the data ingestion, right? It's using an event hub. It's a fully managed cloud scale ingestion of data that's coming in. The ingestion is all about whether all the transactions are pumped in, all the notifications are pumped in right there. The second piece you see is the serverless to process real-time data. Um, it processes the data, it stores them, and, and, and also uh, notifies. Right? You can see the, the picture with the with a small strike on it, right? That's the functions, the serverless sitting there. And then the, the third piece is the data store, right? So the inventory data as well as the transactions, they're all stored in uh, fully managed NoSQL Azure Cosmos DB data store. Now, you can place these very close to your users, right? Particularly uh, for all the read operations, it can be served right from the local region. That's what you see. And then you see the dashboard. Dashboard is nothing but a, a Spring Boot app 
that talks to a Cosmos DB and listens to events that are coming in. Now, as uh, Richard said, in one area, we one region we deploy to Pivotal Cloud Foundry. In other regions, we are deploying to Azure App Service, right? So just before this um, meeting, uh, like a session about five minutes, 10 minutes ago, we provisioned some of the resources, which took us about, uh, for Singapore, which took us about less than um, eight or nine minutes about it took to provision. So now what we're going to do here is we're going to live start deploying deploying some of these terminals, like shop to store terminals, into um, Singapore. Now before we, maybe we should show the existing existing events, how they're coming, coming in, yeah, right? Good call. So we yeah. can show what's existing, and then once we finish the demo, we'll kind of wrap with some of the key architectural principles of EDA, event-driven architecture, what Spring does, what, what Azure does. And, and also kind of undersold Cosmos, which does some pretty remarkable stuff. We showed replication there, but being able to say, here's a master, and let's go ahead and copy different nodes to other regions is, is literally an API caller checking something on a map. And you get multi-read multi, multi -read masters, you get read replicas. It's really neat tech for actually global replication. Sure. So you can see the dashboard where you can see the Boston stores. Uh, you can see the inventory of products and how many are there, and the events are coming in. Uh, we built two pages just to show. One is actually, uh, the one on the left-hand side is uh, WebSocket push, and one on the right-hand side is uh, HTML uh, page refresh that's pulling in data, all right? So here you can see how Boston and London are happening. Now, before we deploy, uh, let's start the deployment and then I'll show the code, right? So because deployment takes a couple of minutes as well. Let's do it. So let's start with Singapore. So here we are. Um, so where am I? I'm right here, so let me go here. And what are you deploying to Singapore here? Yeah, I'm going to deploy to deploy the point of point of inventory first. So okay. Functions. Functions, yeah. Deploying functions using Java code. You're using Java code, right? Um, this is a Java track. I'm just trying to make Aaron happy back there. Yeah, there you or go. Or .NET stuff, you go next door. This is, this is Java's house. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a bunch of environment variables that we need to set, so setting that. Great. And as your function behaves just like what you would expect from a function platform, right? This is triggered based on data changes, storage changes, HTTP calls. Actually comes with the HTTP part built in, so you don't have to add a gateway or anything to that. These are functions that spin up on demand when you're not using them. You don't get charged anything. They don't do anything. It scales back down to zero. So pretty nice platform, multi-language, including Java, which is pretty unique. Right. So I'm going to start a deployment. I'm going to use the Maven plugin to package and then start deploying to Singapore. Right? It's all the way to Singapore. Right? So we're going to start here. It'll start while it starts and starts deploying here. Let's start looking at the code as well. Right? So here is. Um, so here are the functions. Let's zoom in one level. One more level, we can do it's that. It's Visual yeah. Studio Code. Yeah, it's Visual Studio Code. You know, developers tell us that they love it, love this develop, uh, uh, ID editor as well because it's super fast and it's lightweight and it's very responsive as well. Multi-platform. Multi-platform as well. Yeah. So we have a, a bunch of functions. You saw all of these in the in the diagram. So here is the update inventory, right? where it receives a trigger from Event Hub, and it also receives a document Cosmos DB input, and then it processes and then puts it back into the output here. So there's a bunch of code here that, that, um, that satisfies this contract described right here. Right? So we can also take a look at the point of transaction. So the point of transaction code is also a time trigger uh, that pumps in code into the into the Cosmos DB uh, event hub in this case. Okay, so let's take a look at the. Um, it's deploying. It's very close to deploying at this point. Right, and these functions are simulating usage, right? The so timing the, triggers. Yeah, yeah, these time triggers are simulating your point of sale or your point of intake in a warehouse. So when a customer is actually screening, scanning, when a salesman is scanning all the purchases, those are the things that are happening here. Which just can be helpful if you're trying to simulate your own sort of load testing or testing from different locations, deploy functions in whatever your 50 regions around the world. All right. You could actually do that as well. All right, so the first deployment happened. This is the intake. The next one, we're going to uh, deploy a sales terminal, right? So let me go here. 
Let me set set up some more. And you're replicating the functions, of course, in each region, right? Each one kind of stamps out the same architecture over and over again, which is nice for scaling an event-driven architecture. Each environment's not a snowflake. Let me just check. I deployed POS or POI. Show of hands of who's doing serverless stuff now. Some functions. Yeah, the few, the brave. Okay. One more time. And all right. There we go. We start the deployment one more time. Nice. This is point of sale. This is the point of sale. So it'll start pumping in events as soon as that arrives. So we already deployed the point of inventory, right? Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at if there are changes in the dashboard at this point. Um, we are waiting. Nice. We expect to see a new column show up here. Yes. Um, you can see the Boston and London events coming in. So we're waiting for Singapore to kick in. Yeah, um, no, we're waiting to see that. Do we want to show the Azure portal as well, the magic you're creating? Sure, yeah. So let's go. So here's the pivotal where we have deployed the dashboard. Mm -hmm. Let me also go into the portal here. Portal Azure. So you're doing plenty of it programmatically, but obviously people like me who like to click buttons can come mm -hmm. to the portal. So we could see your event hub here, we could see Cosmos, we could see functions. Manage it all here as well, right? I mean, deployment yeah. you're doing from the command line, but all the management scaling is gonna happen from here, read replicas. You must have a big Azure bill every month. Yeah, all of these are here. So let's take a look at uh, um, what's happening in the Boston area, right? So here's the Boston area. If I were to just get the functions alone. Mm -hmm. And you're not creating a new Cosmos, you're just using the replica. Yes, it's only the replica at this point. Um, so these are the, the, the logic for the inventory processing, as well as some of the point of sale and point of inventory devices running right here in Boston. Now, as uh, Richard said, Cosmos DB, there's one instance that's available globally. You can take it anywhere you want to go. Today, Azure supports it in 50 regions, and the number of regions are growing as we speak. Yeah. So, oh, I see the Singapore events are coming in right there. Singapore is here, right here. So let's there you go. It started. Singapore started. Singapore is live. All right. Yeah, right. Singapore is live now. You can see Singapore, it's arriving. Um, yeah. So you saw a third column show up. Um, it's responding to all the events that are now arriving directly from Singapore. So you can keep on adding regions like this. You can start provisioning more stores. You can expand to more regions. Right. It's just limitless at that point. Good. Should we go talk about event-driven architecture a bit? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, what you sh saw there was hopefully uh, you know, life-changing, something that you're all going to go back and tell your families about. But, you know, what were some of those key <clears throat> components that we saw in an event-driven architecture? You know, first I think we saw decoupling, right? I mean, you could deploy these things as monoliths and each kind of piece that talks to the database, it wouldn't have to be four different functions, but in this case we could scale up those functions independently. We could do all sorts of interesting things when you have single purpose single components. Purpose. Is there things you see from that? I mean, that's kind of those key criteria. Anything special there you'd want to point out besides the decoupling? Uh, it's the single purpose. Like each of those functions focuses on one thing and you can scale it, right? It has its own life cycle. It has its own contract. As, as, as long as you satisfy that contract, you can keep on uh, scaling up, scaling down, depending to meet, meet your needs, yeah. Right. You know, the other thing we saw is trigger-friendly systems. It's hard to do an event-driven architecture if things don't emit events. Maybe that seems blindingly obvious, but sometimes it's tricky with legacy systems. You either have to figure out how do you maybe simulate that with polling, things like that, but it's helpful when something like Azure Functions actually has built-in triggers for things like storage 
data services, mm -hmm. HTTP messaging, event hubs. It's nice. So, I mean, any system you want to turn into event driven, how are you helping it emit events in some case? Sure, yeah. Even uh, customers always, developers always ask us about what about user generated events, right? So you can always um, generate and start pumping into an event hub. At that point, it's scalable. Then it can, the, server, the serverless can start responding to those events that are being ingested into it. Right. You know, next up is that scalable infrastructure. The whole point is if I'm trying to do event-driven architectures, in many cases, it's unpredictable usage. So do I have something that if it takes an hour to scale it, it's kind of difficult to be super event-driven. So how am I thinking about infrastructure that scales both in and out fairly quickly there? At the same time, making sure that you have some of the stateless and streaming event handlers. How am I processing event streams? I mean, that's what's exciting in the Azure Event Hubs or Kafka or these other tools. How am I taking data, processing it in real time, not waiting for analytics later, right? We're not going to the store at the end of every day looking at sales. We're looking at sales real time. Real because time. we're processing event streams and making decisions and stocking inventory, not after a crisis happened. We actually know in real time. So, Finding a platform that gives you some sort of streaming support is going to be important. Yeah, and then flexible storage. Not all of this belongs in the relational database. I mean, Cosmos is, I guess we don't say NoSQL anymore, right? It's a schemaless. Yeah. It's schemaless, it? yeah. That's fine. So the idea that I do have a flexible event structure that I can stick in there, if we change the event structure, if Singapore stores different data, theoretically, than US, you could tolerate that, right? The, the database doesn't break. But, you know, some people also do event sourcing with relational databases. So there's a mix. You want blob storage, potentially for logs and like. You want some sort of repository for storing raw events in many cases, and then further analytics. So looking for storage options is going to be important. And then some sort of extensibility, because we're showing something here where we're adding a lot of components. How easy is it to extend these architectures? An event-driven architecture that's rigid kind of defeats the purpose there. So tell me a little bit. After we talk about observability, we'll talk about Azure, but the hardest part with some of these architectures is can you retrace what just happened? As I have a series of triggers of functions, I have a series of events and streaming processors. If someone said what happened yesterday, how are you piecing together a bunch of functions that lived for two seconds, a bunch of things that scaled in and out, and an event stream? That is not trivial. That's not a super solved problem at the moment. So how are you going to actually do traceability to survive an audit or to do some of these other things? That is important. So what's Azure do for me? So Azure, so you saw the event stream, you saw the storage, and you saw the serverless. What Azure offers here is a fully managed, right? Fully managed event hub where you can start streaming data, right? That, that's number one. And also fully managed uh, Cosmos DB. You do not have to worry about replication. You do not have to worry about uh, uh, any management, anything there. Everything is taken care of for you for the Cosmos DB. And the third one you saw there is the functions, right? So Azure offers a, a fully, fully managed serverless computer runtime. You deploy it, it'll be triggered, and it can be done concurrently, and it can scale to meet the needs of however you are triggering it, right? Now, in addition to being all these managed, right, you saw that complex contract that we had for the update inventory. How do you test that, right? So in addition to offering a fully managed serverless compute runtime, we ship the same runtime as a dev tool for you. So you can locally set it up, you can locally run it, you can attach your debugger, whether it's IntelliJ, Eclipse, or VS Code, tooling of choice, and then you can start stepping through the code, right? So you know that it works before you actually deploy, deploy to Azure. I think Cosmos has a local clone as well, doesn't it, for a local dev environment? It, kind of it has an emulator that you can right. use that, that as well. Which right? is tough with cloud development. Sometimes your local dev experience feels weird and it's hard to replicate what's in the cloud. So it's nice, the function runtime yeah. that you can run locally, that's pretty you cool. Can, you can completely run locally. Well, the same contract that you saw, that contract can be registered locally so the events will start pumping into your dev box and then you can step through your code to see exactly what is happening. So it's no, you don't have to wait until to deploy on Azure and then see what's happening there. You can see it on your machine, it runs, and then you can go to the, go to the uh, cloud. The, the global and instant scale, so Azure offers global and instant scale. Today, Azure is supported in 50 regions, and the regions are growing. 
we just uh, deployed to Singapore. If you were to go to, let's say, another country, uh, pick Australia, right? It's just a matter of time, right? Uh, 15 minutes, you'll be up, right? Or you take Hong Kong. You want to st open stores in Hong Kong. 15 minutes, it's all provisioned. Everything is up and running from the cloud point of view. So you still have to s set up a store in Hong Kong, but that'll take longer than longer than the cloud cloud provisioning here. And Microsoft did just add availability zones last week, I think yes. is generally available. So there's multiple physical facilities in a region. Yes. And uh, it's robust, right? Robust functions. Um, so you saw how we deployed, right? Um, so we can keep on deploying. Um, when contract changes, of course, the things will also change. And it's, it's robust enough to handle, handle things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the high throughput and the reliable here. So you saw Cosmos DB, right? Cosmos DB, it supports uh, elastically scalable throughput. You just have to say what is your ceiling, ceiling limit that you want. So it will start scaling up to that point. Now, you also saw the event hub. Events hub, hubs are suitable for hyperscale ingestion of data, right? So whether it's telemetry, whether it's transaction, or events that are happening around the world, all of those can be pumped into uh, event hubs. So the limitless data storage, right? So Cosmos DB, it supports elastically scalable storage, right? Um, it's up to you how much you want. You can keep on increasing. Um, sky's the limit there. Practically, it's, uh, I would say it's limitless. Versus like relational database, I think Azure SQL caps out at, what, it's a few gigs still. I don't think there maybe it's a couple terabytes at the most. It is, it, it, they've increased, and I don't know the current number, but certainly it's Versus different Cosmos. from, Cosmos is like, Huge. It's up to you. You limit your, 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 your cost, right? And you don't charge me as it gets bigger. Yes. No, of course you do. <laughs> so you're not giving away storage. That's crazy. Um, so security is across the board, right? Specifically for Cosmos DB, um, all the data is encrypted at rest, also in motion, right? So it's completely all, all of them. Uh, and some, come, some of the developers ask us that they want everything inside a virtual network that's not accessible from the internet. So that is also supported for all the data options now, virtual network, uh, so that it's, it's even more secure than um, exposing it to the internet here. Good. So some of the ways Cloud Foundry kind of supports this sort of architecture together is you know, all the Spring libraries. We showed a little bit of Spring here and some of the boot apps, but Spring Reactive now, Spring Cloud Stream. You know, we're going to have some, some cool things along the way for Spring Cloud, Spring Cloud Stream and Event Hubs on the way. So if you're building these sort of event-driven apps, you're also looking for the libraries and frameworks to make it a little simpler. So Spring and Cloud Foundry and Java make this a bit, a bit simpler. At the same time, of course, you know, if you're running Cloud Foundry on Azure and we're uh, we won what, Microsoft's Consumption Partner of the Year last year, so we know that a lot of Cloud Foundry runs on Azure. That means that's great, right? That you want a platform on top sometimes of platforms to help with your dev lifecycle, owning infrastructure, and the like. So if I want to deploy Cloud Foundry, a lot of good scale, which is what I demand from an event driven architecture, I have to scale in and out. The key also is the different types of apps. In an event driven architecture, you're going to do some batch processing. You might do a nightly sync between all the events that came in. Maybe they got stored, and you're actually going to make sure you didn't lose everything, so you synchronize nightly via batch. You're also going to do streaming apps, web apps, function apps coming up shortly with Spring Cloud Function and Pivotal Function Service. So a lot of good things coming in the container space and in the Cloud Foundry space for events. And then finally, putting this anywhere, right? And Azure's great stuff in 50 locations. I think there's many, many more as you have your on-premises locations as well. So as I think about trying to run an event-driven architecture the same anywhere, I'm probably doing a mix of things on-prem, off-prem, different providers, co-location, whatever that makes sense. It's nice if you can stamp out the same event-driven architecture, regardless of your infrastructure pool, as much as Azure is a great place to run. So I'll do a quick plug. That, uh, you'll see us hopefully on stage next at Spring One in, in uh, Washington, D.C. as we continue to talk about Spring. But what else can we, uh, questions we can answer about event-driven architecture and Azure? How can we? You know, are there tools that you've looked at or you're interested in or want to see how these work together? If this is a, we're going to take this buddy comedy on the road, what do you want to know about? In the event driven architecture, how do you guarantee the order of Yeah, so the question is how do you guarantee the order of events in the event driven architecture? Sometimes you don't, and it depends on 
If you have the mysterious only once delivery, which is somewhat mythical, this idea of can you really guarantee things don't get backed up and re-delivered, does your whole architecture actually participate in that sort of flow and transaction? So sometimes you go for item potent systems where I can technically do things out of order and I don't have a negative side effect on the systems. You know, when you do do a write ahead, you know, a write log like event hubs, like Kafka, things like that, you are guaranteed that if they get written in a certain order, they will get read in a certain order. You're not dealing with message queues and things where you can technically lose it. But it still seems like the semantics are perfect for guaranteeing order, but the write log sort of model versus a message broker seems like you get higher guarantees. I don't know your thoughts. I think you covered most of it, yeah. I think so, yeah. All right, good. Other questions? Good. Well, if not, we'll be here for the shy people. If you have other questions, we'll, be, we'll stay up here. Azure's good stuff for venture-driven architecture. Cloud Foundry helps you a ton with a venture-driven architecture. Well, I'm really excited what Spring does with reactive and streaming that actually makes these apps easier, because this is a tricky architecture. I mean, as much as we really like building this, and, and frankly, Oscar did all the work, so I, I use we generously, is this can be a complicated architecture. If you look at it's just easier to build a, you know, one app that does intake processing and one data store, and, and that's kind of it. That's not awful. But as I try to scale, as I try to scale individual components, as I want to update these things in pieces, you do want to decompose this into a set of services. So the complexity sometimes is higher, but the payoff is greater. And those are real trade-offs. Sometimes this is overkill. Sometimes this is what you need. I'm glad the frameworks and tools make this easier, but please don't over-engineer if you can help it. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.